Yeah, welcome to the um, second uh, session of the CMFI uh, MassSpec seminar series. Um, yeah, well, today we want to talk about uh, more fundamentals before we go um, a little bit more on the application side. But I wanted to just like point out to you again a little bit like the background. And if you have not been here last time uh, and you want to come regularly, uh, most importantly, please sign up here under this link because that way I compile an email list. And those of you who have, who have signed up should have gotten an email yesterday evening just with the Zoom information. And in case we change something um, in terms of timing or so, I, I will let you know through this email list. So next year we will have a couple of people um, giving seminars from the US. So then we're probably going to move the time more towards like the afternoon. Um, that way they don't have to get up in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, also it's cool when you sign up that we get a little bit background information and it's really cool because after last time more people signed up. So we updated now a little bit here, uh, the background and got like, especially a little bit more like diverse um, here on like the different participants level. And it's great to see like that a lot of like students at, at different levels are joining. And yeah, I don't know, we're uh, a lot, nice mixture with people with like um, no experience to like intermediate and some advanced. Uh, knowledge show I think it's a, it's a nice um, interest group uh, I think yeah more or less the particular interest in, in the fields have remained stable so yeah that's probably what we will focus on metabolomics and then probably also a little bit like proteomics and, and protein mass spectrometry um, yeah main take home message from last time and I just want to reiterate this for a second, uh, was that with like the mass spec tools we, um, we um, present here and we use in, in our lab, uh, we ionize molecules and then measure mass per charge. So that was the most important thing from last time. I, I hope uh, you, you all um, got this from, uh, from the last session at least. And then, yeah, we were talking briefly about um, uh, yeah, like how a mass spec is, is, is built up. In particular, we were talking about like here, like the ionization of molecules and like the types of inlets. So now today, what we wanna um, talk a little bit about is how we then, after we ionize molecules, how we actually um, analyze their mass. So that's probably like the key thing of the mass spec. So like how, yeah, what physical principles can, can we use to, to determine like the mass very accurately. And yeah, before I, I go into like the um, uh, type of instruments we have here in, in our labs, uh, I want to start with like the very first mass spec, because I think this is also a very nice um, principle to, to, to show you how, how mass spectrometry can work. And this is here, the mass spectrograph by um, Francis Aston who yeah, won the Nobel Prize for this for um, yeah, basically like separating um, like the first like ionized gases by their mass. And you can see here like a little bit in this um, aperture, there's like this bent metal part, which basically um, contains like a magnetic field where ions are like a little bit like deflected depending on, on their mass. And this is very much how a uh, more modern sector field mass spec works. So yeah, here in this uh, double focusing sector field mass spec, we basically have two types of fields. So first here an electrostatic field and then like a magnetic field and, and both kind of like work in the same principle. So if we would have um, uh, yeah, here an, an ion beam from let's say our ESI um, ionization source and we get like positively charged ions, then they would be, um, ja, yeah, hier flying into. Ich glaube, mir ist nur gerade eingefallen, dass es anfängt. <lacht> ich weiß, es ist eh alles, was der da erzählt. Das sind noch die Anfängersachen. Ich höre es nur mitten da drin. Das sieht oh, besser aus. Da hast, du nicht auch eine, da hast du nicht auch eine Mail bekommen? Uh, Tim, would you mind muting yourself? Ja, oh, was, oh, was das Christoph? I don't know. But yeah, if you enter, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, coming back to the sector field. Here we basically ionize molecules and then they fly with like certain like velocity into like this electrostatic field. And then as they're positively charged, obviously they will be attracted by the negative charge, right? And that way they're gonna be bent, right? But now if um, 
their speed and their mass is like not well heavy or fast enough like they will be bent too much and actually reach like this um, side electrode here and get like, yeah, like this discharged and explode. Um, on the other hand, if they're like too heavy and have too much like kinetic energy, they will not be bent enough and actually like uh, collide to like the other side of the wall, right? So just the mo uh, molecules or ions with like the right mass will actually like pass um, like this, this field and then, um, well, it would be the same thing with like the magnetic field on the other hand. So now you can basically um, adjust these voltages here, for example, and that way scan through um, a mass range. So yeah, I think this is probably like the most traditional um, mass spec. It still finds like application today um, for like very narrow mass ranges, for example, like an isotope ratio mass spectrometry. So it's still, um, yeah, like contemporary. Uh, but yeah, also like probably like the oldest like technology out there. Okay, so now before we dive more into like the other types of analyzers, I want to quickly mention that yeah, like there's different mass spec types, right? And like uh, here with your um, I don't know Pokemon card deck, they all have like a little bit like different um, properties and different uh, costs. And yeah, so you kind of have to choose uh, wisely when you um, buy one, especially like if you have the, I don't know, opportunity to buy one. Um, but also like when you like plan your experiment and, and your lab or like your collaboration partners have different, um, uh, yeah, like instruments available. So, and then here, just want to mention very briefly, like the main characteristics. This is first of all, resolution and accuracy. This is a very important one. Then obviously we have like sensitivity and uh, linearity of the detector. So here, especially like what's your dynamic range if you have quantitative like applications, this is really important. And then also the speed. So how fast can you measure? And then, yeah, last but not least, obviously like um, the cost, but well, if they're already there, then that might not be the issue, but well, certainly if you have to buy one. Okay, and yeah, just like to show you like a little bit the differences between like different types of like resolution. So here we have, um, yeah, basically the same compound with like a certain isotope pattern here uh, measured at like uh, three different resolutions, all of which still resolve the isotopes, but you can see already, okay, some peaks here like are really nice um, resolved, baseline resolved, and then yeah, when we go to like a lower resolution, then we don't have like the um, resolving at the baseline anymore. And together with the um, resolution, then also like the mass accuracy changes. So this is simply, yeah, like how accurate you can like measure um, a mass. And if you have not heard about this before, yeah, like here, um, mass accuracy is typically um, given in uh, PPM. So like relative error to um, like the, the precursor mass here in yeah, PPM parts per million. And just as a, as a rough guideline with um, high resolution mass spectrometry, I think we typically have uh, better than 10 PPM mass accuracy. And if you have, um, I don't know, like ultra high uh, resolution mass spec, like an Orbitrap or like an FTICR, especially with internal calibration, you even get to like sub PPM accuracy. And if you do such an experiment and it's above 10 PPM, the molecular formula, what you calculated for the molecule or for your new structure, and it does not fit it there, then either the instrument is not calibrated correctly, or I think more often it's a different compound. So yeah, this is something really, if you use like high resolution mass spec to, to take into account um, the PPM error. And then, yeah, so here the different instruments like obviously offer you different resolution. So if we compare, for example, here the um, peak shape, so this is a this is a ma two mass peaks. This is here like the 12C and here the 13C um, isotope of a of a molecule, and this was measured with a quadrupole, which typically provides unit resolution. So here, forget about ppm. Here it's like more or less 0.1 m over c or so. But now if you overlay this with an FTICR spectrum, you see already how way more accurate this is, right? And I think this is this is really important to, to take into account that like here, different machines offer different resolution. And this in particular has 
very strong implications for your data analysis. So for example, if you run a molecular networking job um, and you have ion trap data, then you want to use different mass accuracies than if you have like high resolution orbit trap data. So this is um, important. Yeah, just to give you some numbers here. Uh, so the quad here has a resolution of 1300 in this particular case. Um, and then the FTICR uh, at like 200,000. And that's still at the lower end. So like modern machines reach like several million resolution now. And then, yeah, you have sub PPM accuracy and that goes now to a point that you not only here resolve this like rough isotope pattern, but you can like resolve each individual isotope. So not only like 13C, but also like 15N or like oxygen isotopes or sulfur. So which almost brings you to like an absolute um, elemental composition. So this is, this is really cool what, what high resolution mass spec um, has um, gotten to now. Okay. So now, yeah, again, here was like a, um, like a resolution of 15,000. These two molecules here who have like almost the same mass, just like this very, very tiny mass difference would be still not resolved, right? So they're like under one peak, under a resolution of 15,000. So that's something you probably would reach with like a, um, a QTOF. Then now here, if you have better QTOF with a higher resolution, then you can already like pull them like a little bit apart. And then, yeah, with like 50,000 resolution, they're now almost um, baseline separated. And now with like 100,000 resolution, so this is something we can reach with an Orbitrap or obviously an FT. Um, then they're like nicely baseline separated. And now you can like also like very accurately calculate with like that low mass error like the, the molecular formulas for those. So yeah, be aware that if you have a low res instrument, often there's like different like masses maybe laying under those peaks. And it's a little bit like in chromatography, right? So like often um, mass specs are like considered just like as these lines with like a very specific mass, but no, actually you typically have like this Gaussian distributions here. If you measure them in, in, in so-called profile mode, um, so where you actually have like all like the raw information. So yeah, I think this is this is really important um, to consider when thinking about yeah like what what type of mass spec you you're gonna use and, and you work with. And I think knowing like a little bit like the the capabilities of the of the instrument you have available, I think this is this is really important. Okay, and now yeah, just uh, some examples here. What resolutions would be needed to like separate certain masses that are very close to each other? You know like. Um, those are listed here. We're probably like most interested here, like in the in the higher mass range. But yeah, you can see nicely. Yeah, there's a lot of like elemental composition that will yield uh, almost um, isobaric um, conditions, and then high resolution is, is typically the way. Okay, but now coming to uh, um, the actual mass analyzers and um, talking about like the one which is probably most widely used um, in perhaps most of the instruments here. Uh, yeah, I want to start with like the quadrupole analyzer. And here, yeah, if you have not seen it, the quadrupole has quadrupoles, four poles, right? Like those four rods here. And they're typically, um, yeah, like kind of like a linear uh, thing. And what the thing is, you have quadrupoles. So they have like different polarities, um, typically like the opposite sides are either um, positively charged or negatively charged now. Okay, so now the cool thing here, we have like a combination of uh, AC, DC. So we have like alternating um, current and um, like a constant current, right? So like in this view, they're now uh, both uh, positive and here negative, but now I can like put a certain radio frequency on that thing and switch the polarities. And this is already kind of like how like the quadrupole works because depending on this frequency, uh, when we would basically now switch here between like the, the rods, right? Then like here, this um, positive ion in the middle is obviously um, like attracted by like the counter pole, right? And it would fly towards it. But now if we at the right frequency um, change this polarity, you know, then it will be expelled 
from like this direction and then flies towards the other one, right? And then if that, you know, with like a certain uh, radio frequency um, happens just at the right uh, speed, then like the ion will never reach like one of the rods and discard. And like this trajectory in there is mass dependent. So here for a given radio frequency, you will have a stable um, trajectory for a certain mass range. And we can make use of this by actually ramping this radio frequency over time and then basically scan through like the mass range. And the idea is that you have a constant ion beam. So you have to imagine this now also like in a third dimension, obviously, because we have rods, right? And like ions are flying through the thing. And now they're kind of like spiraling through um, yeah, like the quadrupole and only at the right radio frequency of like the switching of the poles, the ions will make it through, right? So now if you think about if you have a constant ion beam and then you like stepwise increase like this frequency, then you can basically stepwise scan through um, like the mass range. And this is how a scanning quadrupole mass spec basically would work. So now the really cool thing is, or well, first the not so cool thing is because you scan through, you will lose a lot of ions, right? So like a quadrupole in scanning mode, hence is not super sensitive. But what is really cool with a quadrupole is that if you set it only to a particular frequency, you will only let a certain species with a certain mass through your quadrupole. And then, yeah, this would be called single ion monitoring, for example. And then you're like looking at like basically like a quantitative uh, measurement where you only focus on one species of ions at a time. And in combination with like MSMS, where you actually have now two quadrupoles and a collision cell in the middle, you can um, then fragment farther and then look at like the, um, the product ions of this um, fragmentation and set both quadrupoles only at particular masses. And that's probably like the most um, sensitive type of instrument we have available for, for metabolomics. So this would be a triple quadrupole. So Hannes Link, for example, they have one in their lab, and this is probably orders of magnitude more sensitive um, than a QTOF or an, an, an orbit trap. Drawback, of course, um, when you set it only on a certain mass, you will only look like for um, one type of molecule. So that's why this is typically applied for um, targeted um, studies where you have a priori knowledge and know already what you're looking for. Technically, you can also use it in a scanning fashion, but again, then yeah, you have low resolution of the quadrupole, which is not that great, um, and you have also not super high sensitivity, nor is it super fast, so it's not ideal suited for like non-targeted studies um, as uh, for a readout. But for targeted, this is very useful. Okay. Um, all right, and just to show you like some variants here, um, yeah, like this quadrupole can also be used as a trap where you actually put like a potential then also at the front and at the end of like the, um, of this quadrupole. And then you can not only filter ions, but you can store them. And I don't know if you can see my camera well, but to just give you like a size idea. So this is a, a, a linear ion trap with like this four quadrupoles um, that I took out of an old LTQ um, mass spec from, from thermal. So it's, it's not that big, right? But yeah, like here, you cannot really see it, but it, it, this quadrupole is segmented. So like you can actually like change like the field at the entry and at, uh, at the exit of it and hence not only use it for separation, but also for, for trapping of ions. And then this also exists here in like this kind of like donut shaped uh, type of electrode. So this would be like a 3D um, ion trap just to give you an idea. All right, but now um, coming from, from low resolution quadrupoles going to uh, um, high resolution. So here probably one of like the most common instruments, uh, which I think is also a very intuitive way of, uh, of analyzing ions is the time of flight mass spec. So, or in short, we typically call this TOF, um, which is a, uh, uh, yeah, I think a nice acronym. And here the idea is, that you simply, um, yeah, kind of like take ions after ionization and then accelerate them all to a same kinetic energy and then let them fly through a field-free um, drift tube. So that's why a TOF typically has like a long tube 
uh, yeah, when you stop by here in the lab, you, you can see it immediately which which of the instruments um, is a top because yeah, they're typically pretty high. I reach like till like the roof of the um, of the room. Anyway, so now as the ions fly through this field free uh, drift tube, now depending on their mass and as the name time of flight already suggests, um, we will have different flight times depending on the mass. Hence, if we now like detect the ions at the, at the uh, once they like fly through this tube, you know they will reach the detector at a different time point, and then we can simply uh, plot like this flight time versus intensity, so the number of ions we detect, and this is mass dependent, obviously. So we can plot this here as a mass spectrum. Okay. So now uh, this is how a TOF looks like. Um, this is actually a Maxis of chambers, I think has the impact too, but it looks like very much like this. And as I said, yeah, it has like this long tube. So at the back here and then at the front end, you like this uh, round thing. This is the ion source. And one really interesting thing is that in between the flight tube and the ion source, there is also a quadrupole. So this mass spec here is not only a TOF, but it's actually a quadrupole. TOF, uh, hence I should actually put a Q in front of this TOF because this is what we call a Q TOF. And this has like very important implications for the type of experiments you can do with it because now you can combine the two and use the quadrupole to first isolate a certain um, uh, ion species. Right? So like here you set it on a certain frequency. So let's say it will only let through um, ions with, the, uh, um, with M over C 300, right? so like, let's say this is here like the screen ion, and then after you isolated them in the quadrupole, you let them collide with some neutral um, gas molecules in a collision cell um, under a certain um, energy, collision energy, which then will like make the molecules fragment. And then after that, it goes into like the TOF, Again, with the pusher, you accelerate the ions. It flies through like the um, line, uh, through the um, field-free uh, drift tube um, till it then reaches like the plate detector, and you get here your fragment spectrum. So now, okay, this is already um, a little bit uh, of what we're going to talk uh, in the new year in our next session. So this would be a tandem mass spectrum or like a proton um, a product ion spectrum. All right, okay, so now. I showed you like two principles of yeah like um, the quadrupole, the TOF, and like well the combination of both. Now of course an important question is, all right, we we separate um, the ions either by their flight time or by the radio frequency of um, the polarity changes of the of the of the quadrupole. But now how do we actually detect them? And then there's two common types. Um, this is like the electron multiplier, which is yeah basically converting like collisions here of like this ions once they um, yeah basically reach here um, uh, yeah like this this dynode um, to then yeah multiply them each time they hit the other side of the wall right so like every time they hit it they release some like electrons and then yeah like an electron multiplier uh, they multiply the signal till we get like here a current that we can actually measure. So this would be typically used in a, um, in a, a quadrupole, for example. And then here we have a similar principle with like a plate detector. So here we have like multiple plates and each time an ion hits, it also releases some electrons and then yeah, it kind of like hits it at the next um, plate before it then yeah, like also like um, is um, measured as an, as an electric current. So this would be typically apply um, used in a, um, in a TOF, for example. But now there's also uh, other mass specs that do not really measure ions by having them collide against like a surface, like in the electron multiplier or like the plate detector, but actually measure them by inducing a current. And this is, I think, especially important because these are like the most high resolution instruments uh, we have available here. Um, and this is like FTICR. And then later, I'm going to show you also like the newer generation um, Orbitrap uh, mass specs that also are based on uh, FT, which stands for Fourier transformation. Okay, so now yeah, here those basically work with like huge magnets, FTICR, um, where you have here your mass spec. 
um, uh, system in, in a type of yeah, like high vacuum uh, chamber. You have your ions enter here on the on the left before they then go here in the so-called ICR cell. And ICR stands for ion cyclotron resonance. And the cool thing here is, okay, this is how one of like the largest ones at PNNL in um, in the US looks like. So this is a 21 Tesla magnet. So it's really like a huge um, instrument, very costly, uh, but also like very high resolving, right? And now I've got a little video for you, which I think like shows like very nicely how an FTICR works. So here, yeah, we have like this kind of like schematic setup. We have uh, uh, elect uh, electro spray ionization, which we showed uh, or discussed like last time, right? So here you have now one of like the two ionization models where actually the ions evaporate out of like this tiny droplets. Um, then yeah, you create like a constant ion beam. Now this goes here through several like multipoles that work kind of like a quadrupole, but mainly for like transferring ions, not for really um, like separating them till, yeah, it then basically reaches this ICR cell, which is like in the middle of like this super strong magnetic field. And now the cool thing is, and let me pause for a second, um, they're kind of like trapped in that strong magnetic field. But now you have here like this um, electrodes where you can actually also change like the polarity of, and now given here uh, a certain radio frequency, you know, they start moving in that magnetic field. And now you basically ex excitate them. So they go to like a certain, um, uh, yeah, like orbit inside of this ICR cell before you then turn off that radio frequency and let them fall back to their natural trajectory inside of like the magnetic field. And now you have something here that is a, um, yeah, basically an inductive detector. And this is basically something like a, a like a generator or like your, your dynamo on, on, on your bicycle, you know, where like ions fly by like an electrode and that way induce a current. And this you can measure here and then simultaneously for all the ions that actually like circle around here. And then you record this and then, yeah, basically get like the super weird um, signal here, but thanks to Fourier transformation, you can then convert like this multiple frequencies here in, uh, yeah, like here it's such a frequency spectrum. And again, this is mass dependent. So then this you can convert in a very accurate um, mass spec. So, okay, this is in a nutshell how FTICR works. And again here, like basically the mass spec itself is also the detector. So this is an important thing. This is the summary. And now, yeah, like a newer version or um, an alternative version. So FTICR still goes strong, but uh, we fortunately now have also orbitraps, which do not rely on a magnetic field, but like an electrostatic field. Um, and this has been, I think, quite a revolution for, for modern mass spectrometry, in particular proteomics um, and other yeah, like uh, bioanalytical approaches. And yeah, here as the name suggests uh, orbitrap, uh, orbital ion trap. We have like ions go around like an orbit of a central electrode here. And it's really cool because now depending on their mass, like that speed, how they like circle is mass dependent. And more importantly, their movement um, on like the set axis here is um, mass dependent. And this can be easily measured if you have two place detect, uh, two like inductive detectors basically in there. All right, so now how does such an instrument like look like? Here we have like a setup again. This is a, um, a hybrid instrument um, in combination here with a quadrupole, but also even a third uh, mass spec is here, like a linear ion trap, that thing I, I just showed you um, is in there. And then, yeah, you have here your Orbitrap analyzer in the middle. And yeah, this is basically how, how it would look like. Certain like ion packages are like orbiting the central electrode and then also moving up and down. And again, I think this is the um, important um, movement we are actually like measuring here 
then again you get like a frequency and the same way as with FTICR you then apply for year transformation to then get your high resolution mass back and just to like set this a little bit in context so now with like top of the line Orbitraps, you can also reach 1 million resolution so FTICR, I think, is still like the probably most high performing instrument in terms of resolution, but Orbitraps are like getting really close. And now instead of like a room with like a big 21 Tesla magnet, this machine here just fits on the bench top. So I think it has like really important implication for um, cost. And yeah, also like, I don't know, you don't need to like build a new building to like house your, your mass back. So I think that's why they're, they have become really popular and a lot of labs um, around campus here in Tübingen um, actually have, have Orbitraps available. So now I think this entire like development has, has been, been really interesting. And I think one of like the, the technical problems, um, uh, the engineers and, and I think in particular, Alexander uh, Makarov who, who invented that type of mass specs, um, had to tackle was how to get the ions into um, the orbit trap. So in here, there's something called a C trap where you actually like store ions and accumulate ions till you then push them with like a fast push into the orbit trap so that they kind of like go in and reach like that stable orbiting um, trajectory. And this is really cool because it does not only like, first of all, enable, um, yeah, I think like a, 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 a <coughs> mass spec experiment in, inside of an orbit trap, but it also lets you control the number of ions that actually go into the orbit trap. And this has really important implications for uh, mass accuracy because there is a thing called, um, yeah, space charge effect, which I think is very well um, uh, explained with this example here from the Simpsons where uh, the doctor uh, explains um, the three Stooges syndrome. So if you have too many ions at the time, right, and they fly through space, here, this is an ion, um, then yeah, basically your space represented by this door is of course limited. And then the ions can't really like make it through or here actually uh, more accurately would expel each other, right? So because they're all like I don't know, positive or negatively charged. So this is what we call space charge effect. Um, yeah, symbolized through the three Stooges syndrome. And yeah, so that's why controlling the number of ions that go into um, an uh, orbit trap or also other ion traps um, is actually important. And there, what we use to, um, to control this is the so-called automated gain control. And I think the best way to <laughs> think about this is that AGC would be, yeah, basically like a bouncer in front of like that uh, C trap here. And yeah, when the ion trap is full, so that's basically the number of ions you set as a user that, that should be allowed to, to go in at once. Yeah, then they close the door and say, all right, um, full enough. And then they inject this ions in, in the orbit trap, do the readout before they then do the next experiment. And yeah, this automated gain control is either reached by a certain number of ions, or if there's not enough ions, then there's typically like a timeout, which um, in your settings would be the maximum injection time uh, when they say, okay, now we waited long enough. Okay, the um, experiment needs to go on. So please um, inject now the ions. Um, yeah, and this way you can basically control the number of ions and avoid the space charge effect. And this has important implications also a little bit for like the type of experiment you do. Because obviously with like an AGC, you kind of manipulate a little bit like the dynamic range. Because if you would set your AGC very small, you know, then only like so many ions can enter and you may only like look at like the top, um, the most important things in, in your sample. That's why typically if you do, uh, let's say, a, a accurate mass measurement and you want to have like very little space charge effect, you would put your AGC target lower. But if you want to have like a broad overview, so you want to have like the maximum dynamic range, then you would actually like loosen this AGC, um, yeah, basically increase like the target um, of, of ions and then have yeah, a higher number of ions 
and a higher space charge effect. So your accuracy would maybe go down a little. So yeah, this is an important difference to the TOF where you do not have such an HEC. And I think this has in particular for flow injection analysis or so-called FIA quite um, some important implications, which I think has uh, yielded in a couple of very interesting discussions in the community. And I'm, I'm sure Hannes or Torben in the future FIA sessions will maybe talk a little bit more about that and why particular uh, TOFs are very well suited for, for flow injection analysis because of that reason. Um, all right, but now um, for the rest, I also want to talk about um, some new things. So I think now we covered mainly like the basics um, about like, yeah, commonly applied mass specs in, in, in uh, different labs. But yeah, you can of course do also very fancy things um, with, with that type of like instruments. And one particular thing which I got like really excited about when I heard about it was that you can use an obi trap to actually do single ion charge detection. And this has been, yeah, from a paper here from uh, the Heck Group in, in the Netherlands, where they used a mass, um, an, an Orbitrap analyzer to actually detect single ion species. And the idea here was that they would make this HEC, what I just explained to you, um, so low and so short, right, that they would go to like um, um, time scales that they would only inject um, single ion species. So that does not mean single ions, no, not only one, but for like each sub charge state, for example, um, they have only one representative. And this is like in particular important for native mass spectrometry where you have not homogeneous like protein mixtures, for example. So when you have like um, very complex glycosylation and you have, I don't know, hundreds of different like possibilities, then typically, um, yeah, you can't really resolve the charge states um, anymore with like contemporary like deconvolution technologies. So here, knowing actually the charge state of each ion you measure is really useful. And yeah, so this is kind of like what they did. So this is for, uh, um, I think this is a viral um, like particle. So it's super high mass, you, you can still measure it. But then, yeah, you basically see here that all like these peaks are kind of like only at like the same height, right? Only these two ones here, those were actually three ions or two ions for each of them. But yeah, so now the cool thing is that that represent like only one molecule with that charge state. And now if you would look very, very closely, you would see that actually like the height of these different peaks is like slightly different. And this has something to do with basically like the type of detector the Orbitrap has. Because now if a molecule has more charges or an ion has more charges, so let's say because it's so huge, right? This has, uh, I don't know, um, 200 charges or something, um, then of course, like the current that is induced would be higher the more charges it has, right? So now you can actually fit this and this is exactly what they did. They used like a couple of like um, model compounds here and then they did like a linear regression where they measured actually like this height here to the number of charges of like the different um, ion species. And then they found that there's a linear dependency and you can like, yeah, basically calibrate um, now here this detector response. And then based on this height, tell that this molecule likely has so and so many charges. And yeah, I think this is really cool because it, yeah, basically here in this histogram um, enables them to determine then here like um, a kind of like a charge state and that way resolve uh, proteins and protein mixtures <clears throat> in a mass range and especially from like um, um, kind of like uh, uh, heterogeneous um, uh, uh, yeah, like species that you could not resolve otherwise. So this, is, this has been a very important development in the last years and, and I'm very curious how, how this will move on. Okay, so now the other thing, and I think this is gonna be um, the last actually uh, thing I wanna quickly introduce, this is ion mobility. So now this is not really mass spectrometry because we're not measuring mass anymore, but now here we're measuring 
um, the behavior of ions in a drift tube. So the idea is that if you have like different ions with different masses, but more importantly, with different shapes, <coughs> that depending on this shape, they will pass through um, here like a drift tube at different speeds. And you kind of like have to um, imagine this a little bit um, like here, um, let's say uh, um, a sheet of paper, right? So if I would like take this sheet of paper and let it fall down, you know, it probably takes longer time than if I would like crumble it together to like a little ball, even though they have exactly the same mass, right? So, and this has something to do here, yeah, basically with like the um, resistance of like this uh, drift gas in that tube and hence like the mobility of the ions, how they go through like this, this, this drift tube. And yeah, I think for, yeah, especially like intact protein analysis and yeah, like the analysis of like certain like protein folding, this has important implications, but now, or important use, but now also this is yeah basically about to like reach like routine analysis with like a new type of um, of ion mobility called trapped ion mobility, which is like yeah here used in this new type of like QTOF from uh, Pruker, which is called the TIMSTOF. So yeah, TIM stands for trapped ion uh, mobility uh, mass spectrometry. And yeah, here you kind of have like an, an ion funnel, and basically you can trap ions. And then, yeah, let them uh, also be separated here by their mobility. It's kind of like a two stages um, type of thing. So, yeah, this is, um, yeah, how how it kind of like looks like. So you have like here like this Tim's analyzer, and then yeah, the idea is that you first trap here this ion, so you accumulate them, and this has important implications for like the sensitivity of the system. And then in the second stage. You kind of like move on this ion package to then separate them by their mobility, right? So this is not net, well, it is kind of mass dependent, but it's also dependent on like the shape of like the actual molecules. So and this is really cool because now, in addition to mass, okay, because yeah, here behind that Tim's device again, you have your quadrupole and TOF analyzer then, so you can obviously measure mass, but you get like an additional dimension of information here, and this is ion mobility here on the y-axis. And as you can see very nicely um, in, yeah, like this data set from um, Florian Meyer and others in the in the MAN lab in, in, in Munich, there are certain like molecules that have very similar masses, but they have significant different drift types. So now when you have like very complex mixtures, for example, like in a shotgun proteomics experiment, for example, like this TIMS dimension really helps you to further separate things that have the same mass, right? So like they're isobaric, they have the same molecular uh, um, elemental composition, but because obviously they have different structures or different folds, you can like separate them now in that ion mobility dimension. And yeah, I think this is um, definitely um, a very exciting um, development and I assume that yeah this will more and more um, come part of like the um, routine uh, workflows especially for like non-targeted analysis. So now also the top has become really fast and this creates like ton of data and I think we're still at the beginning of actually like developing software tools to effectively make use of this but yeah I'm, I'm definitely very very curious on um, how like this developments will go and, and how we will implement this in the future. All right, and now, yeah, I think this two-dimensional plot um, is also like the perfect primer for what we're gonna talk next time, where we actually wanna discuss a little bit on how mass spectrometry is coupled with liquid chromatography. Um, and then in particular, how we can use this to do non-targeted metabolomics and non-targeted proteomics um, in combination with tandem mass spectrometry. Um, yeah, I think with that, that's uh, pretty much all I wanted to show you today. And now, yeah, I'd be happy um, if there are any questions or discussions or, yeah, if you want to say something, feel free.